Yeah, my name is Jesse. I um, lead the team that uh, oversees the base operating system development on Chrome OS. So that includes kernel, firmware, hardware security, a bunch of other stuff. Um, so, hi. Yeah, and and as I added to the notes, two things we really love getting in our email is questions and CVs. So feel free to send any one of them. Uh, all right, let, let's let's talk a bit about what the agenda today. So we want to cover a bit about our kernel lingo. So what's a rebase uprev, and then what is continuous rebase in our terms. Uh, we'll touch base about how we try to test and cover our or the RC kernel in our testing uh, ecosystem. And then we'll talk a bit about some of the pains we have with upstream and with implementing uh, our upstream uh, ideology, per se, in Chrome OS and with our partners. Please feel free to stop us at any time to ask questions. This is very much a discussion-driven or question-driven uh, presentation. Yeah, just raise a hand or throw it in the notes. Uh, all right, so generally speaking, the Linux kernel in Chrome OS comes in many versions. Uh, from 3.18 all the way to 5.4, and we're, we will be starting to embrace 5.15. We'll talk a bit about what it entails. And each of these kernel versions ships with multiple platforms, and each platform has multiple devices. So many, many millions of users per each kernel version. And the kernel versions or the specific kernel version a platform ships with is selected when a platform is brought up. We typically try to select the newest one because it's easier to do a bring up. There are exceptions to that. In some cases, we would do a refresh for a platform, and then we will uh, choose the, the kernel version that uh, the, the, the original platform started with. What is a rebase? Uh, so the way we, we, or we call a rebase when we move or when we adopt a new kernel into our uh, repos, and then we will Chrome OSify it. What, what does that mean? That we'll basically rebase all the non-upstream patches and we carry some of these on top of the newest kernel. And we will create a new repository that uh, new platforms can choose to use from that point on. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a process that uh, takes, or at least used to take several weeks. Uh, it's led by several of our TLs and different teams, different technology teams. And basically the rebase is broken into topic branches and each team, as an example, the storage team will take a look at storage related topics, will debug them when it's not working, will work on conflicts of rebase. And then we have an uprev. An uprev means in that directory structure moving a platform from one kernel to another. So from time to time, we uprev platforms. We want to keep them uh, as close as we can to upstream. And we also want to remove the amount of kernels that we maintain and, and ship platforms with. And so we're basically, uh, yeah, sorry, Jesse, take it up from here. Yeah, so this is taking that, that rebase kernel that Alex mentioned and actually deploying it out into the fleet. Um, and there, as you can imagine, this might, this is a, a little bit of a, a process. Um, you know, we don't dump the new kernel on everyone all at once and, you know, then try and fix up the regressions afterward. We try and do a lot of internal testing. We do what we call internal dog fooding, where we have internal users use it and report issues. Um, and we try and fix all of that up before it gets out to beta channel. There's a, there's a feedback mechanism built into, built into Chrome OS that we use uh, heavily for this process, um, plus all of our internal testing. So the um, Android CTS test suite actually covers quite a bit of our, of our quality, um, in addition to the Chrome OS uh, testing that we have, uh, or our, our automated testing system. So there's a lot of testing that goes into it, but then we, 
we actually today rely uh, quite a bit on feedback reports from internal users and early users, more than I would like, uh, just because our test coverage is not perfect. Um, and we'll touch on that on that later. Uh, but we're trying to improve that by getting some of our tests up into kernel CI so that we deal with fewer upstream regressions. Although um, when I first started, I thought that the uh, up, dealing with upstream regressions might be more of an issue than it's turned out to be. We do have to deal with upstream stuff, but um, that is more around dealing with stuff that isn't upstream. <laughs> so surprise, surprise. Uh, and historically, Chrome OS had been pretty good about this. Uh, lately, there's been some drift um, in the past few years uh, with some vendors um, not being able to push things upstream for various reasons. And then we have to deal with that at, at uprev time. Um, so that can cause delays. Um, but overall, I really want to get to more automated test coverage here. I think the, the free desktop graphics model um, is actually a pretty good one here. Our graphics team just ships upstream uh, because they've got good enough API test coverage and compatibility test coverage with their API traces. Um, so I'd like to get you know, a similar level of confidence from our kernel side of things. Um, and that most of the most of the time here is not really spent on um, on working on bugs. It's actually spent on administrative stuff, figuring out if a bug that's been reported is related to the new kernel and is actually a regression. <laughs> so uh, most of the work is kind of meta work, uh, but we're also working on that. Um, so uh, Alex is going to comment on on this part, but um, they can be tough to predict uh, how how they go. Yeah, so when we first started, or historically, we tried to operate a few years ago, and then we decided to pause that activity. And then three years ago, we resumed operating, and now we're going at it every other year for a platform. And what we discovered is when you operate an old-ish platform from 4.19 to 5.4, apparently there's a lot of breakage. Stuff don't doesn't work, or it, typically every big component uh, doesn't work. Something is broken. Um, many or most of it is typically not related to upstream, but some is. And when we dug into upstream, you or, or apparently these platforms are not tested, or obviously not platform, not all platforms are tested. And so we, we are trying to increase our test coverage uh, with upstream. And that is for us to be able to plan and resource an uprev because unless you do that, you really don't know what, how, how deep the rabbit hole is. You only discover that once you try to uprev. And then it becomes a test-driven activity where you run a bunch of tests. We have thousands and including CTS, millions of tests that we need to pass. And they fail, and we try to fix them. And, and this is an ongoing activity of trying to fix all the tests that are failing to match the existing or the shipping kernel. And, and then, as Jesse said, we release that to dog fooders, internal users, and we use our dev and beta channels to allow some uh, feedback from uh, the, 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 the community. Uh, but but that's hard to step because we don't know how many engineers it will take to to do an upgrade. So we kind of thought of sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to expand on what you mentioned about the testing. Um, I did say that like a lot of the time is spent looking at feedback reports and figuring out if things are regressions. Uh, a lot of the time lately has also been spent on fixing tests that are actually not broken, <laughs> but appear to be broken when we go test against a new kernel because of some timing issue or some, uh, some kind of small compatibility uh, problem with the test itself and not with the feature that it's supposed to be testing. So I think that's you know, unfortunately fairly common with functional testing, but it's something that we're also working to improve. Right, thanks for that. And so maybe a way, the, the, the thing about 2X on the capacity, that's the way we try to test. So we have A-B testing for the kernels, we have our own CI system that is running and we, we load kernel A on half of the devices, or uh, almost half, and then we load kernel B and we compare it. Nothing fancy about that, but it's an ongoing thing. So we, we constantly test. We all, always deploy a new build, and we test that as we go. 
uh, I was going to mention one more thing I forgot to mention on the earlier slides uh, that Alex showed that list of the kernels we support, which looks like a nightmare and is less of a nightmare than it used to be, but um, it's still a challenge. So our goal is to reduce that to two kernels in the field, um, host, host kernels anyway, and then uh, one kernel that we're working on to push out to replace the old one. Um, so that's the, that's the goal. Like Alex said, a uh, new kernel every other year on every device. Um, that's getting a little more complicated now because we've got uh, more VMs in the picture, and so each of them has their own kernel that we've got to deal with. But in some cases, that gets dealt with for us. Like, for example, in our Android VM, one of the motivations for moving to a VM was that we can leverage the, the GKI kernel from the Android side, um, which Greg maintains a big part of that and makes it really simple. Just move up and don't have to worry about compatibility testing and everything like that because uh, we know it's we have confidence that it's going to work. All right, so introducing continuous service. So we, we thought about how we can improve the testing of release candidates and upstream and actually catch breakage to our devices as they happen and work with upstream and work with our internal teams on making the upstream kernel healthier. Uh, and so, so basically what we're doing is we are basing our patches on top of every RC. So the first time we do it, it's kind of hard. There's a lot of conflict. But then we incrementally add uh, the, the conflict resolution uh, on top of the new RC, and so it becomes incrementally easier. A huge kudos to SemiHalf. SemiHalf are our contractor that are actually doing that, and they have came up with amazing innovative tools to do that. Uh, so we, we basically rebase every RC, and we have added a new repo that was also in slide in the slide with the directories the first one upstream so upstream is a repo that basically changes on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis with every rc release and the the added the latency of us rebasing on top of it and then we have for each new platform and for each platform that we uprev we run a, a continuous test against upstream to see that the, the testing status is the same as the shipping kernel. So from the very, or from the very early days of a platform, when we bring it up, we actually track the health compared to upstream. We have a few examples. I've added a few links. We have more of breakage that we caught, reported and fixed on the upstream kernel. Uh, and we, the, using the, this way, we have tests, example, internal tests that are failing for the different uh, teams. Uh, we can get engagement uh, from our developers. So we send emails, we have an automatic tool that just creates bugs for every failure, et cetera, et cetera. So now we have a lot more involvement internally for upstream links, and we don't have to wait until we are based on top of it. All right, report the failures. Uh, so we have spent quite a lot of uh, time thinking about how we report the failures internally. Um, it was a, the domain of the problem is a bit more familiar or easier to us. Uh, and so internally, we feel like we have evolved enough so that breakage is both caught and addressed in a timely fashion. Our upstream work should should be uh, better, I have to admit, and we are working on that. So we're looking for ways to report breakage and share our testing uh, results with upstream. We are planning to start in the immediate time frame to look at the integration with kernel CI and try to inject errors through that path. But we are also open to other suggestions. So we had different thoughts on the matter, sending emails, using Bugzilla or whatnot. Uh, but again, it needs some amount of uh, work on it. I see there is a question being, being typed.
Yes, you do want to take that? Yeah, so uh, depending on how you count, that is that is actually our goal to, to get down to two kernels out in the field. We actually share the kernel version and we, de we deploy the same kernel version on, on our ARM devices as we do on our x86 devices. So the uprev targets the whole fleet eventually. Um, the, the process of rolling it out is kind of staggered. So, you know, it might hit a AMD device and then a you know, media tech and then Intel or something like that. But um, it'll be the same version and then eventually it'll roll out to everything. And then um, we'll get ready to roll out the next version onto those devices. Um, if, but I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, Arn. I don't know if you want to unmute or comment, but. Oh, the same image. No, that's, Alex, comment yeah, on that's, the actual kernel config limited. Right, it's not just the config, but but our image includes, so, so we don't separate the image of the kernel out of everything else. We have one image per platform. So uh, you will still get an image per platform. And we build, yeah, the, the platforms tend to have configs with their particular driver set, right? So. Um, yeah. Schwann is. No initRD or anything. And yes, the, uh, oh, Linux next. Um, we have been talking about that. I don't know, Alex, if you want to comment on. Yeah, it's high, it, it's high on our priority list. Uh, we see the value there. There are actually other trees besides next. DRM tip is, is another one that we see a lot of value testing uh, as we go. But before we do, we want to hash out our reporting strategy, especially upstream, because if that, that's the most important thing, that that's how we scale uh, and get everyone's involvement and not just a handful of people. So once we do that, we will start integrating more and more trees and rebase on top of the from the answers. And I actually hope hope to expand this. One of the things I would really like to see is um, the ability to just run like if you have a Chromebook, select a channel that gives you or select a flag that gives you the upstream kernel um, as your kernel for that device, and then we can collect feedback reports and, and telemetry and everything and uh, see how well it's working. Um, we've got a little ways to go to get there some um, some upstream backlog and uh, and then functional testing to make sure things like audio don't <laughs> don't break when you when you switch over but um, that is something we're we're working towards for sure right. so another question are these tools for testing our see candidates available yes everything we're mentioning here is upstream and public uh, so I can follow up there is quite a lot to talk about about the actual tools for rebasing. Um, these are upstream. The RCs, the rebased RCs are also upstream. So if you go to the upstream folder that I pointed into uh, from slide three, that would contain the latest RC, but all of them can be accessed if you look at our manifest. That's how our repo structure work. It points to a namespace merge slash continuous slash something and then git ls remote would give you all the different branches uh, the actual testing environment or our continuous integration environment no that's not open and not available for the public from obvious reasons um, do you use uml at all for testing no we do do a lot of virtualization testing though so we'll build, build um, vm images for like gcp and um, do a lot of testing there, but not UML specifically. All right. Let's see. Um, so yeah, this touches on what we've been talking about. Um, so one of our kind of guiding philosophies in Chrome OS is to is to upstream first, and that that applies to all of our projects. Um, it's complicated, as you might imagine. We've got a lot of partners that we work with, uh, a lot of different projects that we're engaged in. Um, on the kernel in particular, we track everything with, with metadata in our commits and our Git tree. So if you go to the chromium.org Git tree and uh, check out the kernel, you'll see a lot of patches tagged with these things. Um, 
and there, there are a few variants of these, uh, but we've got like upstream patches, which, which means we've just backported an upstream patch wholesale, wholesale um, and we pull it in. And that happens quite, quite frequently because we need some new feature or a bug fix or uh, whatever. Um, and their variants there might be from Git, where like it's queued in Git, you know, to head to Linux for the next release. We'll tag it that way so that we know, you know, uh, to check it for our next rebase that we might be able to drop it out. Um, and backport just implies that we've had to do a little massaging. So it's the same thing. We pull it from upstream, but we've had to had to uh, adjust it a bit. So that that way it kind of flags to us, hey, if we've got a problem in this area, we can look and make sure the conflict resolution is done well. Or maybe we broke something in that process. Um, from list is something that's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more on edge. Uh, we don't like to see this as much because it means okay, yes, the patch has been posted, um, but not necessarily accepted yet. It's better than nothing because it means at least the process has begun. Uh, but in some cases, we see we see people using this to kind of tag it with something more positive than Chromium, and then they never follow up on it, and you know it never gets accepted upstream, and then we have to forward port it uh, in continuous rebase or, or next full rebase. Um, so, but like I said, it's better than nothing, um, uh, but we do want to minimize these. And then Chromium, these are the patches that like, for whatever reason, we can't upstream or, or maybe have been rejected from upstream or require some significant re-architecture, um, or in some cases are experiments. So we do actually push stuff out uh, to our fleet to get data on, hey, is this approach even worthwhile? Um, so the, uh, the core scheduling stuff that Joel worked on um, and continues to work on is an example of, of that. We had some Chromium versions, um, tried a few different things, and then Joel would settle on something and push, push the final result upstream. Or the stuff that Yuzhao has been working on with uh, MGLRU, the new memory management uh, framework, um, where we collected a bunch of data, got some really awesome results, and decided, oh, this is uh, pretty significant, so we move forward. Um, and then, of course, there's you know the kind of perennial headaches of proprietary graphics stacks, where you know we're, we might keep a an open source or a or a closed source kernel driver for the graphics stack, and you know there's no point in pushing that. There's no open source user space, so uh, we have to carry those, and those cause some pain. <clears throat> I think the vendors have gotten a little bit better at, at making their those pieces portable and minimizing the API surface and all that, but uh, we would still vastly prefer a fully open source stack like we've done on uh, the Qualcomm devices lately. So on the next one. Uh, Let's think maybe there are two new questions. So uh, are your tests open? Can you share them and or add them to existing kernel test suits? Yes, they are open. I can follow up. I haven't included links on the slide. That's my fault. Uh, if you want please send me an email. Uh, we can follow up. They are open. You can just Google task tests and Chrome OS testing and whatnot. Uh, you can run them on any device that you have. They are not specific to kernel, right? The, the, what, what we test is, is the entire complex setup or system that we have. We, we care that Android runs and that touch, touch pad and touch screen works, et cetera, et cetera. So our testing is basically to test the different uh, domains and capabilities, software or hardware, from our perspective. And when we change the kernel, we compare them A, B for a different kernel. So the failures will not, or the failures will map to kernel changes, but they will not be specifically testing kernel components or kernel suites. Or something. I hope yeah, so. it's not like LTP or something where we're just, you know, hitting a system call with uh, with particular arguments or something like that. They tend to have some higher level components. Some of the tests even include uh, Chrome automation, which is really important for us. And I think, I personally think it's really important for overall kernel testing to see how um, how higher level workloads like Chrome uh, behave, especially in light of like scheduling changes or memory management where, um, you know, some small change a kernel developer might think, hey, this looks great. It works great on this server workload. Uh, but maybe it really poorly um, interacts with uh, interactive performance or causes responsiveness to really decrease for an interactive workload. So, uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of this stuff we're trying to push into kernel CI. So we've got um, some work with the kernel CI team to 
uh, have Chrome OS as one of the OS images that we can deploy, and then we can run these higher level tests uh, without too much modification. There's been some work to take some of our testing and you know port it to like a Debian type environment as well, um, so that it would mesh better with the existing uh, kernel CI infrastructure. So we've got we definitely invest heavily and spend a lot of time on that. We've done a couple of hack fests with them, um, so that that's something we'll continue for sure. The next uh, question. Sorry. Yeah. On the next question, yeah, the uh, long-term efforts. So this is a big part of my job, <laughs> putting, putting pressure on, uh, on our partners. Um, but know, there's a slide about that, though. Let, let's, yeah. let's keep it to that slide. Uh, I, I promised Lauren in the email exchange before this uh, that I'll include the slide, that, so we have one. Uh, Jesse, numbers on Chromium upstream from list. I think you have some numbers. We do. Uh, Gunter. Um, creates a, a monthly report for us that we share at our kernel kind of all hands meeting. Um, we do tech talks and stuff. And yeah, so that's where we kind of beat the drum, like please upstream, uh, don't don't let these numbers get worse. Um, so yeah, we do have numbers on that. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's um, on the order of hundreds, I believe, that we're still, still uh, missing from the upstream. Um, and the, the from list and, and upstream numbers are like the upstream numbers are really large. From list is, is pretty big. Um, Chromium and from list are the ones that I worry about the most. I could pull that up in a minute if you want to take on the next question. Right. Uh, are there plans to provide images that prefer the open source driver, like Mali and Adreno GPU drivers in a development slash upstream channel? Jesse, you want to take that one as well? Um, so we have that for we have that for Adreno. Um, the latest stuff we're shipping on Qualcomm devices is all free Adreno based. Uh, so Rob and and Christian's team have been doing a lot of work there. Uh, so that's super cool. Um, we do have a variant of the uh, for some of our other platforms. I think it's just the MediaTek ones because the other ones are IMG based. Um, if you pull down the Chromium tree, you can. You can pass a use flag when you do the build to get the uh, Panfrost driver stack. Uh, it's not very well tested uh, for us right now because we haven't, you know, like Alex mentioned, we have some um, testing infrastructure limitations and we're kind of capacity constrained. So we don't have an automated testing set up for that yet. Um, I'm hoping we can move more in that direction eventually. Uh, but um, again, that, that gets back to our partner relationships and, and everything else. So. Um, but it is something that you can run if you if you want to. Uh, jumping back to the other question about the Chromium patches, um, our most our top offender uh, is is our media subsystem uh, in the kernel, um, and we've got fifty four as of last month Chromium patches in that area. So that's uh, like drivers, media, B4L stuff, um, things like that. Uh, so that team has been, it's actually come down a lot. We used to have almost 200 there. So that team has been working to kind of address that backlog, which is great. But um, the next one down is, is some of the Vert.io stuff we've been working on. We've got 30 some patches there that are tagged as Chromium. Um, and cross CC is another one, our embedded controller drivers. We tend to see some churn there as we bring up new platforms and add a few new EC features or interfaces on a per platform basis. Um, but a lot of that gets to get, it's going to be dropped now because we've moved to a new way of handling our sensor data. Um, so anyway, that's kind of order of magnitude for some of our different subsystems on the Chromium patches. So on the uh, upstream side, so I think hopefully we've made it clear that uh, we want to upstream everything. A lot of our people work really well with upstream um, and uh, sometimes even enjoy the work. <laughs> so uh, it's something we want to do. Uh, we want to make Linux better. Uh, we want to make our own lives easier. Um, we run into kind of, you know, there's, I don't think there's any surprise here. The people that I see on the attendee list here are all familiar with all of these issues. Um, one of the big ones that we deal with is maintaining responsiveness, and this affects probably our vendor partners more than it does us um, in terms of getting stuff upstream. So sometimes you have maintainers who are like, you know, really on the ball. They they tend to spend a lot of time on on a 
you know, assigning reviews to other people in a subsystem area or getting reviews themselves and providing really actual feedback to like, you know, document a path, map out a path to getting a, a particular feature upstream. Other maintainers, you know, for whatever reason, don't spend a whole lot of time on it or provide, you know, very vague feedback at best. Um, I, I don't see Russell here. I, I put architecture maintainers here as a troll for him. <laughs> so it's falling on deaf ears because he's not around. But anyway, uh, that has been a problem in the past. I think it's much better now, um, like on the ARM side, especially we're mainly focused on the 64-bit side of things now too. Um, so there's a whole bunch of sub maintainers there that we're, we're happy to work with. Um, and then some things uh, mm -hmm. are, are really, really stuck. Um, and one example here is memory management. Um, so there've been some interesting discussions lately with like Yu Zhao's patch set on MGLRU or, uh, or Willie's stuff with, um, with Folio where it doesn't seem like we have a clear path forward or even agreement among the major players about how we would move forward in this subsystem. I mean, some of, the, some of the threads I've seen indicate like, we just shouldn't change anything because we might break something. And while that's true, you know, it also kind of, kind of leads us into an evolutionary dead end. So, um, so you know, I have a wish list here of, of what I would love to see here. Um, I know we've got a good code of conduct. Generally, I think the culture of the, of the mailing list and community has really improved over the last few years. Um, but I think from a maintainer perspective, um, I think there's still kind of a, a lack of consistency. And so I thought it might be nice to have kind of some metrics around responsiveness, around acceptance criteria, around like, you know, as a maintainer, what is expected of you in terms of um, giving people a roadmap, either a strong knack with some really clear reasons or, um, or a, a pathway out. Uh, and I know this is a challenge given the consensus nature of the, the community that we've developed here over the years, but um, it would be nice to have some more consistency here. Uh, the other usual stuff applies, right? Like the, the yak shaving and um, you know, people saying, oh, well, why don't you just change your product architecture? You know, if you ship this board instead of that board, you know, you wouldn't have this issue or things like that. It's like, you know, coming in to a, to a, uh, a discussion with that kind of approach is not that productive, um, typically. Um, so like going, getting back to the memory management side of things, uh, one of the things I think would be great to see is some kind of consensus around what benchmarks are important. Um, so one of the things Yu Zhao struggled with on MGLRU is just getting some engagement some, from some of the big, uh, big contributors who deal with cloud infrastructure, for example. Um, so we have some internal data, but that's you know, not, not sufficient for um, justifying an upstream push. We'd like to get some other, other folks on board, but he's had a hard time getting agreement on that or even what's important. Um, I think generally speaking in this particular case with MGLRU, like it seems to be almost universally a huge win. Um, and we'll, we're going to be publishing some more data that we're just spending money to get uh, in order to, to justify that. But, um, but I, I still see this as a, as a problem and it's, but it's, it's bigger than just memory management, right? It, this is across the board. Um, you know, how, how do we not, not just get agreement on a patch, but like get an agreement on what's important for that subsystem so that other patches that come in later can kind of funnel in the right direction. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is, is experimentation. So I mentioned that we do experimentation and collect telemetry um, as we're doing development. And this is a really important part of our development process. Uh, it lets us get real world data from a ton of data points and really inform our decision making about whether something's gonna work or if it has some core case that we didn't consider and it's really blowing blowing people's machines up. Um, and I, I wonder how we can enable this in the Linux community more broadly. Um, you know, we have revision control, we can revert. Uh, but on the other hand, it's like one shared tree, right? Um, so I just wonder about this. I don't know how, I don't have a particular idea about how this might work, um, but I think it would be pretty valuable to, to see something um, that would enable more experimentation in the upstream kernel. There's a question. Uh, have we considered maintaining a stock subsystem? Uh, oh, yeah. we, 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 we would be happy to maintain the whole memory management subsystem. <laughs> right. I'll take people at it tomorrow if that's what it takes. Uh, but that's, I think that's not the, the issue. It's, it's more um, that we have 
both competing priorities among the different stakeholders in a given subsystem and um, and kind of competing development philosophies and there's no tiebreaker so uh, in a sense it's like the the development process lacks a system of justice to arbitrate between uh, between parties in this case and um, you know the the protest sayings goes no justice no peace and i think <laughs> that's kind of where we're at in some in some subsystems uh, but it's just overall a challenging problem because you have multiple stakeholders their viewpoints are valid you know their their competing priorities are valid but how do you reconcile it um, in the case of memory management like in my view you know maybe it makes sense to have a different memory management subsystem for four gigabyte systems versus one terabyte systems um, but a valid pushback on that as well. Then you've got split testing, split effort, and you know one of them is going to drift relative to the other, and one of them may be maintained better than the other, and, and that's true, right? Um, but if you've got enough people on both sides, maybe that's fine. Um, but again, that gets back to like, what are the criteria? What are the important benchmarks? I don't know. Based on the amount of writing, you touched a nerve, Jesse. Uh, so, uh, yeah. It, so. Is the main memory management maintainer employed by Google? I don't know, maybe. It's Hugh, hard. I mean, he was, the, he was a key maintainer, right? Yes, and he's on the cloud side. Um, and he, you know, he's viewing it from the cloud perspective, but we've got people like Johannes too, right, at Facebook, um, looking at it from a slightly different perspective. And I think both of them tend to be very conservative, which, like I said, is valid, but, um, but how do we move forward? I don't know. And, that, and just because they're employed here doesn't mean we can like say, Hugh, you will do this, right? I mean, that's not, <laughs> that's not how we work here anyway. Oh, Andrew, yes. Well, Andrew, yes. But he tries to stay very aloof as well. So again, he's not going to receive direction from Google about like merging a patch. That's not how we, how we manage this stuff. Right. Web Hat Linux has similar problems. Some bug fixes are stuck on pushing upstream plus one to any solution. All right, partners. I promised to Loren now twice to talk about that. Uh, so we obviously interact a lot with partners. We, we build platforms. They consist of SLCs and, then, and different components, each with a vendor, and they all need to upstream. And from time to time, or <laughs> quite a lot, we have to police our uh, repo to make sure that no downstream uh, patches are submitted. So the general approach with partners is that we don't support, we're, we don't allow Chromium patches. So uh, Jesse said that you know, media substance system, we have 54 Chromium patches. That's not a lot, right? So the general ballpark is probably a few hundreds of patches for the entire tree, and we're trying to reduce that as we go. So uh, we treat our upstream depth with uh, tremendous seriosity, or we, we, we are very serious about that. We, we see the, the pain later when we upload platforms and we try to maintain the quality, having downstream or from list patches that haven't land into any maintainer's Git or upstream, they translate into tremendous money, right? Or, or time that we spend on them. And so generally with partners, we have to police our ideology of upstream first. And so partners have to ship patches upstream. They cannot land them in our tree without that period. Yes, there are exceptions. We can discuss them, but all with very good reasons and multiple hours of you know, meetings and documents, design docs of why we actually need them. Uh, but to that, we, as Jesse said, we have different tags that we can lend in our tree. We have from list, from Git, and from upstream. So when a partner or even ourselves, when we upstream a patch, we, we don't wait until it lands upstream from obvious reasons. It, the, the time it takes to land or from the previous slide, one can understand it might take some time and we still are in the business of shipping platforms to users. And so from time to time, we would land a from list 
uh, patch in our repo. But then the person that lands it is on the hook on reverting it and replacing it with <clears throat> the upstream version of the same patch. We typically maintain or track this depth in our uh, internal bug tool. Uh, we create a bug for each of these CLs and we try to revert them on this kernel or later when we are based to a newer kernel, we drop every from list and from git patch that actually landed in upstream, we drop it and we take the upstream version. So, Florian, I hope I've answered your question. Well, again, as I said, yeah, feel free to reach out. As I said, and I, I have to say again, we really like getting questions from upstream. So feel free. Yeah, yeah and on some of those, I mean, I know, Laurent, you're working on the new, new camera API. Um, the, the, uh, I think that the new API, um, is a lot more, I mean, it's a better designed API for, for current needs, right? Or at least for our needs. Um, I think there is some concern among folks that it, it would make it easier to do, you know, closed space user space stuff kind of like happens on the graphics front. Um, but I don't think that's, an, that's a reason not to do a good API. Um, so like I said, a big part of my job is pushing on vendors, leaning on vendors, putting pressure on to make sure things are open. And so, I have done that on the camera side, and I'll continue to do that. Um, I, one of the issues with ISPs and, and image processing in general is there's, you know, there's a lot of vendors in that space. Um, there's not, it's not necessarily as standardized as the GPU side of things. Um, so we could probably do better in terms of having common low-level programming interfaces. Um, you know, something like uh, like Web GPU or or um, OpenCL type stuff for for ISPs, that might help with unification. Um, but right now, I think it's still kind of wild west out there. Um, but anyway, I, it's definitely easier for us if, if the full stack is open or on Chrome OS. So we continue to tell vendors, please give us a full stack. We basically have one minute, and I think we've answered all the questions in the shell notes. Um, one last, I guess, uh, call to action. Um, I mentioned kernel CI a couple times. Um, we've been seeding kernel, the kernel CI lab with like lots of Chromebooks. So please, you know, submit your tests there uh, for your subsystems. Um, get get coverage that way, uh, and respond to bugs. And um, you'll, knowing that you'll get some coverage on like desktop class systems, um, a lot of Chromebooks there, ARM and x86. Cool. And like Alex said, you know, we're always looking for good people. <laughs> so. Yeah, don't hesitate on that. All right, thank you everyone who spent their morning or evening with us.